All right, so my name is Sham Dwarknath. I am a research scientist with the Person Group and the Materials Project. And I'm actually going to show you today how to use PyMetGen and a new capability to generate and manipulate hetero interfaces. So before we start this lesson, let me show you where to go. So this is the default CoCalc view where you, if you start up, you can basically get to a file like window and the file tree. And in this, there is a workshop folder, which we'll click on that. We'll then click on lessons and we'll click on 03 underscore hetero interfaces. I know in some, one, in, some, uh, in some of the participants folders, you'll see a 03 underscore, underscore surfaces. That's an artifact from a previous lesson, from a previous version of the workshop. Just ignore that, it's not really relevant for today. You'll wanna be in the 03 underscore hetero interfaces. So if I click on that, you should see three files, the main lesson, a silicon SIP, and a lithium iron phosphate SIP. For the purpose of today's lesson, I'm actually going to make an empty notebook. But if you would like to, or if you feel like you need to come back and look at some of the material, you can click on the main lesson notebook, and you'll see all of the material that I'm using today, with many of the cells actually already pre-filled out. Alternatively, you can go to workshop.materialsproject.org. And this is the website you came to to see the logistics and understand what's going on, including the actual schedule for yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Over on the left side, there is a little drop down that says workshop. You can click on that, go to day one, and click on working with services and interfaces. What you'll see is a rendered version of the same notebook has already been pre-rendered and run for you that you can go through and look at. And this is the same material, just in a slightly more accessible format. So I'm gonna close this and I'm gonna go back to this window. Now, for the purpose of today's lesson, I've done one extra thing. So if I click new here, I can click on Jupyter Notebook or I can go down here and click on Jupyter Lab Server. If you click on the Jupyter Lab Server, you'll actually get a new window that shows up. And if I go back to the main, it'll look something like this. Now, the traditional Jupyter Lab is what you would probably run on your own computer if you're working with Python. And we actually have some new capabilities where we can render crystal structures in Jupyter Lab itself. Unfortunately, this does not currently work within the CoCalc ecosystem. So rather, I'm going to have this pre-run and available so that I can switch to this window to show you what the crystal structures and interfaces look like. So I'll go back to CoCalc. And in this folder, again, I'm in lessons, 03 underscore header interfaces. I'm going to create a new Jupyter notebook. And I'll give ourselves another minute or so before we start the actual lesson. All right, let's begin the lesson on surfaces and header interfaces. So, so, so to start off, let's have a couple different definitions of things that we need to think about. When we talk about a hetero interface, we're talking about an interface between two different materials. And if you think about the number of materials there are in the materials project, about 145,000, there's theoretically 145,000 squared minimum potential hetero interfaces. We then think about the different ways in which we can cut a material, the different Miller indices that are important. We can easily get to a number of possible header interfaces that are far too many for us to actually 
consider even computationally. So we need to use a couple different methods to sort of reduce down how many considerations we need. Well, one we could do is use different mathematical methods that let us constrain and say that interfaces are only allowed with certain rules. Another methodology would be to focus on interfaces we can model. So these are called coherent interfaces and coherent interfaces contain some sort of periodic boundary condition along the interface. That means they repeat on and on forever along the interface surface. And that brings us to the first important class within PyMetGen, which are surfaces. So in PyMetGen, in order to construct a surface, we actually have the ability to choose which Miller index and actually ask a generator within PyMetGen to just make that object for us. So let's first start off by importing a structure that we can manipulate. So I'm going to start off by typing in from, oh, from pymatchen.core.structure import structure with a capital S. And in that same cell, without running it, I'm going to type in just lithium iron phosphate, where I have LIFEPO4 is equal to structure dot from underscore file. And I'll use my parentheses there, which it'll close automatically for me. Put my quotes, type in just lithium and press tab. If you're in the right directory, Jupyter or CoCalc will actually auto-complete this for you because it knows that the files that are here are na named what they are and it can figure out how to uh, which ones are applicable. Then I can hold down shift and press enter to run this and I'll have the lithium iron phosphate structure. Now, I mentioned that there is a way to view this in a 3D format. Unfortunately, within CoCalc, we can't do that. So we can just print this structure. So I type in LIFEPO4, which is the lithium iron phosphate structure we imported and press shift enter. You'll see a bunch of text, which is actually a description of the structure summary. So there's a bunch of lithium, iron, phosphate, phosphorus, and oxygen, which is the lithium iron phosphate structure. If we had this as a SIF, we could use a viewer to look at it. If you're running this in a traditional Jupyter Lab 3.0 environment, like you could set up on your own computer, I can click on this other uh, tab where I have that running. I could type in import crystal underscore toolkit first, and then print the lithium iron phosphate structure to the, to the window, and you'll get this nice viewer here. So in this viewer, we can click on different atoms, whether it's the lithium, the oxygen, the phosphorus or the iron. We can see their positions that are labeled in numbers in the, in the three coordinate numbers. And we can rotate around the structure to look at what it looks like. This is very useful when you're trying to understand what manipulations you're using and whether they worked or not. Now let's go back to CoCalc. I'm gonna scroll down and I'm actually going to add a couple cells here so that we have some space. So the next thing I need to do is actually add oxidation states. And there was a question earlier on in the Slack as to whether or not the oxidation state affects anything. It does depending on the analysis you're using. If you're exporting this to a VASP input, which we'll learn later tomorrow in automating DFT, it doesn't have an effect. But if you're using one of the many analyses methods within PyMetGen, then it can potentially have an effect depending on whether or not that algorithm can take into consideration the oxidation state. So for this purpose, let's actually add oxidation states to iron, lithium, phosphorus, and oxygen. So I'm going to type in LIFEPO4 dot. I'm going to type in just add, and I'm going to press tab. What we'll see is that it'll start to autocomplete what are the different methods that could be used if we have just add there. Well, I want the add oxidation state by element. I'll click on that. The autocomplete will type all of that in and I can click my parentheses. Now, if I press shift tab here, you will get the doc string in the bottom corner. The doc string tells me what does this take? And as you can see in the example, it takes a dictionary of oxidation states and that dictionary happens to correspond to, well, the lithium iron phosphate structure that I'm actually using. So no coincidence about this, this was chosen on purpose. So if I highlight that dictionary, it is valid Python. 
I can copy it and then close that window and paste it back in between those parentheses so that I can run this. So now I'm adding the oxidation states to lithium, iron, phosphorus, and oxygen. I hit shift enter and that will run. Now let's take a look at what this looks like. If I type in the LiFePO4 structure again and run shift enter, we can see that this in the structure summary, all the lithium atoms, the iron, the phosphorus, and the oxygen, they all have charges. This is something that's going to be important when we look at surfaces. So how do we deal with surfaces? In PyMedGen, a surface is called a slab. There's a reason for that because it's definitely cut from a bulk crystal. So it's not quite the same as what we'd consider traditionally a surface. There is a periodic boundary condition along the direction of the surface. And it's our job to make sure there's enough space so that it acts like a surface. So let's actually bring in something that we use to generate surfaces called a slab generator. So I'm going to type from pymatgen.core.surface import slab. And I'm actually going to press tab here. The autocomplete will tell me I have two different options. I can import the slab class itself, or I can import the slab generator. So press enter for the slab generator and press shift enter, which will run the cell. And now I can use slab generator. Let me add a few more cells by pressing the plus button. So now I need to actually build a slab generator and then I can use that to generate slabs. So let's just call this gen for now, make, make our life easier and say gen is equal to slab generator. And again, once I have my parentheses, I'm gonna hold down shift and press tab to get my doc string. And my doc string tells me I need a couple different things to slab generator. I need to give it the initial structure I need to give it a Miller index, a min slab size, and a min vacuum size in that order. So if I close this, I can now type those things in. Well, the initial structure is going to be the lithium iron phosphate. So let's type in LiFePO4, comma. The Miller index is given as a tuple, which means it's basically a parentheses and then a list of numbers. In this case, I'm going to give it the 001 Miller index. So I'm going to say parentheses 0, comma 0, comma 1. And then outside of that parentheses, I'll press another comma to go to the next argument. In this case, it's now the min slab size, which I'm going to say is 10, and then comma. And now I get to choose the min vacuum size, which I can choose as 10. Now I'm gonna actually add one more argument here and I'm gonna do this by name because I don't remember which order it comes in. And it's usually has a default value. So it's nice to explicitly state out what this is so that I know in the future what it is that I'm setting. And that is the center slab option. So I'm gonna press comma, center, underscore, slab, and I'm gonna set this to true. What this will do is make sure that the slab is in the center of my cell so that I can see vacuum on both sides. If I run shift enter, I'll now have a slab generator. So let's actually get a bunch of slabs here. So I will say slabs is equal to slab gen dot get, oh, get underscore slabs, parentheses, run that. Oh, that's right. I didn't call this slab gen in this example. It's just called gen. So gen dot get slabs. And that will take a few seconds to run. And then I can look at the length of slabs and it tells me it's a list of size five. Well, what exactly do these look like? Let's add a couple pluses so we can look at these a little bit more. And let's take a look at what the first slab looks like. So if I type slabs and put the uh, square brackets with a zero as index, I'm getting the first item in the slabs list. Hold down shift enter and I'll get another structure summary. So notice again that this looks just like what we saw before. It has a lattice, it has an A, B, and C, angles, a volume, and a bunch of periodic sites that are decorated with charges. So by definition, this doesn't look any like anything different. Did we actually do anything? 
Well, if we compare it with the previous structure, you'll see that the C direction is actually quite a bit larger, and it's actually a minimum size 20. If I go to my Jupyter lab where I can view this, I can actually scroll down and show you in the same example what something like this looks like. As that, and as you can see, there is now quite a bit of a vacuum or empty space on either side along the C direction of this lattice. This is what we call a slab. Now you notice that there are two surfaces in this situation, and that's one of the reasons why it's not a surface. And given the material, if this was a single element system, and if those surfaces were symmetric, we could use this to calculate a single surface energy. But because those surfaces are not symmetric, we actually can't do that. We would have to compute the average surface energy for both of these, or use some intelligent scheme in which we chose the right set of slabs to get unique surfaces and then use those to compute the energy. So let's go back. Um, I'm going to give everyone just a few minutes to catch back up. Um, and scroll down just very briefly. So let's look at one interesting property of the slab. What I'm going to focus on is whether or not the slab is polar or symmetric. And to do this, I'm actually going to look at every single slab within the list of slabs. So I'm going to go and build a for loop and say for n comma slab in enumerate slabs. The enumerate is a built-in function that will return an index and the element within that list. So if I have a 10 element list, it'll return zero and the first element, one and the second element, two and the third element, and so on. So if I put a colon here, I'll start the for loop. I can press enter and this will get me to the next line. And I can type in print, put my parentheses, and now I can print something for each and every single slab within this list of slabs. So I can first print the index n, and then a quote and type in polar colon and a space. This will make sure it prints polar for every single and every single slab within the list, a comma, and then type in slab dot is underscore polar. Notice that I'm referencing this variable slab in the for loop, not the entire slabs list. This is one of the nice things about Python where you don't have to rely on indexing in every single loop in order to access items. Now I'm actually going to add another quotation or another element after this. I'm going to say comma, put a space, put quotes, and say symmetric colon with a space. Finally, another comma, and this time I'm going to ask the slab if it's symmetric. So slab dot is underscore symmetric, and then open close parentheses. I'll hold down shift and press enter, and I'll run, and you'll see that you actually have a list of five, uh, five elements, one for each slab, with the index at the beginning, whether or not it's polar and whether or not symmetric. Now, this ability to compute whether or not the slab is polar is only possible because we added oxidation states or charges to all of the elements within the slabs. Whether or not it's symmetric just depends on the termination or the chemistry on each surface. And this will be important later on when we're building hetero interfaces. Notice that only one of these slabs is in fact symmetric. And in fact, that symmetric surface happens to not be polar. While this is not always a given fact, this is actually a pretty good situation. And if we were to compute a surface energy, we'd ideally like to start with nice nonpolar symmetric slabs, because those give us a single unique surface energy versus these polar non-symmetric systems where we have to add additional considerations, like dipole correction in order to compute one specific property, which is the surface energy. 
Now, I know this was very fast and there's a lot thrown at you. So I'm gonna give a lot of time for the next exercise, which is gonna be very, very simple. The whole goal of the next exercise is going to be loading the silicon structure and actually just getting a number of slabs from it and taking a look at them. So for this exercise, first make this cell a markdown so people can read it easily. I'm gonna call this exercise one. And I'm gonna say, make a silicon slab. I'm gonna add a few more pluses or cells here so people can read this. And how about I give people a minute and a half before I start the first few lines of this. Now I will let you know that in this same folder, there is a silicon structure called si.sif. So if I click on the files here, you'll see there's an si.sif here. You can use that and load that. All right, let me add in the first few lines of this exercise. So I'm just gonna say silicon, oh, I actually have to type in the, less, in the lesson itself. Silicon is equal to structure with a capital S. So structure dot from underscore file, open and close my parentheses, open and close my quotes, type in SI with a capital S dot SIF. And if I shift enter and run that, I have my silicon structure. Now I can make a slab generator by saying slab gen is equal to slab generator with a capital S for slab and a capital G for generator. Open and close the parentheses, give it my silicon structure. And in this case, I can give it any Miller index. I'm going to choose the one, one, one direction. So I give it a parentheses, open and close those and type one comma one comma one. Um, then I'm gonna give it a min slab size of 10 and a min vacuum size of 10. If I shift enter and run that, I'll now have a slab generator. And I'm just going to say, give me the length of slab gen uh, dot get slabs. So I give it the, the built-in len command, open parentheses, type in slab gen dot get underscore slabs, open and close my parentheses again, and press shift enter. And it will tell me that if you run get slabs, there are two unique slabs here. So let's actually save those and say slabs is equal to slab gen dot get underscore slabs, open close parentheses. And if I scroll down and add a few more cells so I can be in the center, I can take a look at slab zero. Looks like it has a C size of 25 and has something like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, atoms in that unit cell. What about slabs one? that also has a C size of 25 and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight atoms in the unit cell. 
So what's different between these two? Well, if I come back to the Jupyter Lab where I can actually view these, I can scroll down and I can look at the 3D viewer. If we look at the silicon cell, there's actually two unique different planes. So there's this plane here, and then there's this two atom plane here. So those are the two unique terminations that we can get if we cut the silicon along the 111 direction in basically in two different places, depending on how we shift. So this adds a complication when we're thinking about building hetero interfaces because it adds a multiplicity and increases the number of surfaces to consider that we didn't think about. Well, we'll have to deal with that later. So let's go back to CoCalc and let's actually begin the second lesson, which is on epitaxial matching. Now, the idea here is that when we think about hetero interfaces, we need to be able to enumerate those that are the most likely to happen. And it turns out this is actually not that easy and there are very few good mathematical methods to try to think about how to enumerate them. One example is grain boundaries, but grain boundaries are only interfaces between a material and itself. We need a method of enumerating uh, interfaces between two different materials. And to do this, we actually generated or we uh, made a, a, a methodology within PyMetGen that looks for how you try to identify the best substrate to grow a new material based on the geometry of the interface. We can use that method later on to actually build hetero interfaces. So we'll start off by actually investigating this epitaxial matching methodology. And to do that, there is a class in PyMetchN called the Substrate Analyzer. So I'm going to type in from pymatchn.analysis.interfaces. And I'm going to very briefly press dot and press tab here. And the reason I'm going to do that is just show you the sort of different modules that are available within this interfaces module. There is a module called ZSL, and this is the Zur and McGill algorithm that's actually the basis for this substrate analyzer we're going to use. There's a module called coherent underscore interfaces that we'll actually use in the next lesson. And for today, we're going to, or for right now, we're going to focus on the substrate analyzer. So if I click on that, it will auto complete the substrate analyzer. And then I can type in space import space. And in this case, I'm actually going to press tab. Oh, that didn't quite work. All right, CoCalc is not going to participate with me. Normally in Jupyter Lab here, you can type tab and it will auto complete all the things that you can type in or you can import from that module that you're already referencing. I know there is a substrate analyzer class with a capital S and a capital A. So I'm going to type in substrate analyzer, hold down shift and press enter, and I'll now import it to the substrate analyzer. So I'm going to type, uh, actually have to instantiate this so I can use it. So in the next cell, I'll type in sub analyzer is equal to the substrate analyzer. If you want, you can press tab here and it'll auto complete for you, but I'm going to manually type this out. So substrate analyzer, I'll open and close my parentheses and I'll hold down shift and press tab. What this will do is it'll actually tell me what I need to give the substrate analyzer. And it tells me that there are two arguments, film max millers and substrate max millers, but these have default values. So I don't actually need to give this anything when I'm first making the class. So let's exit that little window, run shift enter, and I'll have a substrate analyzer. Now, in order to use this, I actually need to figure out what the matches are. The matches tell me how to take one material and interface it with another material, or really the epitaxial matches. So I'm actually going to make a variable for these, call it matches. I'm going to say matches equal to, and in this case, I'm going to make a list out of whatever substrate analyzer gives me. I'm going to open and close parentheses. I'm going to say sub analyzer dot, and press tab here. As I said before, this gives me tab completion. 
and I happen to know that calculate is the method that gives me these matches. So if I click on calculate, it will auto complete these for me. And I realize I don't have enough cells under this to make put this right in the center. So let me center the cell on the screen again. And then next to calculate, I'll open and close parentheses. Now, here I can press shift tab again. And it'll again, CoCalc or Jupyter will show me the signature. It'll tell me what it is I need to give calculate. And it tells me I need to give it a film, a substrate. I can also give it an elastic tensor. This will consider the mechanical energy of straining the film in order to match it with a substrate. And then I can give it preferential film and substrate millers that I want it to consider if I don't want it to generate all the possible ones that could be used. And the draw strings actually tell me more about what these are. So film, substrate are both structures. The elasticity tensor is an elastic tensor object in PyMetchN. And these film millers and substrate millers are arrays. So let me go ahead and close this little window. And I have this matches is equal to list. And to the list method, I'm giving it subanalyzer.calculate. And in the calculate parentheses, I now need to get it my film and my substrate. Now, in this situation, I'm going to actually type out the names of the keyword arguments, film and substrate, so that later on when I come back and look at this, I understand which material or which structure plays which role. Otherwise, it can be a little confusing when you just see an entire string or array of different things and you don't know what each one means. So I'm going to type in film is equal to the lithium Li iron Fe phosphate PO4. And then I'm going to say substrate is equal to the silicon. So now I have a substrate analyzer defined that will get me the matches between lithium iron phosphate and silicon. If I press shift enter here, this will run, it'll take maybe a second, in this case, a little bit less than a second, and I'll have a number of matches. Let's very quickly look at what those matches look like. So if I just type len and open parentheses, I can then give this method the matches that I just generated, type shift enter to run it, and it'll tell me, oh, this list of matches is of size six. So I know I have six different matches. Well, let's take a look at one of these matches. So in the next cell, I'll type in matches, put the square brackets to reference an item within that list and give it the first match. So that is index zero. Right shift enter, and you can see that it gave us a substrate match. Now this doesn't look all that nice. It just doesn't print all that well to the CoCalc window. So I'm gonna do one thing that makes it look nicer. It's something that it's not obvious all the time that this is something we can do, but most of the objects within PyMetchN are actually, uh, you can convert them into Python dictionaries, and those dictionaries tend to print pretty well in Jupyter. They have a little bit cleaner of an interface. So I'm going to type dot as underscore D-I-C-T, so as dict, and do open and close parentheses on that and run shift enter. Now this will actually print a lot of information to screen, but it's quite, it's pretty much the same things that you've seen before. So this is a dictionary version of the same thing. And you'll see that there are a number of keys called like such as film SL vectors, substrate SL vectors. All of these reference either the film or the substrate. The base vectors, film vectors and substrate vectors are the surface vectors of each surface that was considered for the match. There's film and substrate transformations. These represent sort of the transformations or the rotations that were used along with the supercells that were made along the surface to test to see if these two interfaces or these two materials can be matched together. And then the film and the substrate miller tells us which substrate plane and which film plane is being used, not the termination, just the geometric plane is being used in order to figure out this match. And these matches happen to be purely lattice matches. So that's the Zur and McGill lattice matching algorithm. We also get a full strain tensor. So this is a technically a uh, 2D matrix or a rank two tensor 
which means that it actually has multiple components and it's not a single value. There's also a von Mises strain. So this is sort of the average strain that you would compute if you're thinking about converting the tensorial strain into a single scalar. And if I had provided it with an elastic energy, it would compute, or an elastic tensor, it would compute that elastic energy. Now, if I want to change some of the parameters of this matching, how would I go about doing that? I know from knowing the Zurn Miguel algorithm that there's actually a number of tolerances that are really important and they can change the way in which I compute those matches. Well, let's use some Python and ask it to tell us more about the substrate analyzer. So I'm going to click plus to give myself a bunch of cells and I'm gonna type in help the command we learned the primer yesterday and give it the substrate analyzer class. So substrate analyzer, the capital S and a capital A, shift enter to run that. And this will print again, a lot of information to screen. This will actually tell me a lot of information about the entire substrate class. I'm gonna scroll up until I get to just the beginning. So in, the, in here, it says, this is a substrate analyzer class. It tells me about some of the methods that it has, the resolution order. And it tells me that in fact, this class inherits from something called the ZSL generator. And it turns out the ZSL generator is what actually has all of the tolerances because that's what implements the Zurin McGill analysis algorithm. So let's go ahead and import the ZSL generator so we can understand what those tolerances do. So let me scroll back down. center myself and go into the next cell. And I'm gonna import that ZSL analyzer or the ZSL generator. So I'm gonna type in from pymatgen dot analysis dot interfaces. I'm gonna press the dot here and press tab again. And notice there is this ZSL module at the bottom. If I click on that, it types in ZSL for me. I can press space. I can press type in import. And here I'm going to import the ZSL analyzer or in this, sorry, the ZSL generator. So type in oops, import space ZSL, all caps, capital G generator. And if I run shift enter on that, I'll now have the ZSL generator imported. And now I can ask it, okay, tell me how you work. I can use the help method that I showed before. I can also use shift tab that I showed you before, but I'm gonna use a slightly different method this time to show you another way to ask Python to tell us about how to use the methods or classes that we have. So here in the next cell, I'm gonna type in ZSL generator, and that's a capital Z, S, L, and G for the generator. And I'm gonna press the question mark. And if I shift enter on that, again, CoCalc will show me, okay, here's a signature. And it'll show me that in fact, there's a bunch of tolerances here. There's an area ratio tolerance. There's a length tolerance. There's an angle tolerance. And there's a max area. Now, in order to really understand what all of these things do, you have to look at the original ZSL paper, but all of these represent different kinds of tolerances. The area ratio tolerance, the length tolerance, and the angle tolerance translate into how much strain the analysis algorithm is going to allow. Whereas the max area translates into how big of a supercell the analysis algorithm is gonna consider when it's trying to make these matching interfaces. So we can tweak these in different ways in order to do different things, allowing more overall, overall strain, allowing more linear strain, allowing more she shear strain, or just allowing for bigger matches. And because the substrate analyzer inherits from ZSL generator, we can actually use these in the substrate analyzer as well. Now, for the next exercise, we're actually going to go ahead and use the substrate analyzer to get matches for the lithium iron phosphate material. And in order to do that, I'm actually gonna type out a few things for you to be able to start with, right? So we click on this cell, I'm gonna convert it into markdown and put 
a nice markdown heading that says exercise two. And the question is going to ask how many matches, uh, basically how many matches for the lithium iron phosphate and silicon um, system can we get if we look at basically the LIFE PO4 100. Oh, I realized that that's get rid of Grammarly. There we go. We're going to look for the 100 interface of lithium iron phosphate. And we're going to basically match this with silicon with the 111. This is what we want the substrate analyzer to find matches for. So let's start off very briefly by asking how do we build the substrate analyzer? Well, we can type in sub analyzer is equal to substrate analyzer. And here again, we have these arguments that we can tweak the ZSL algorithm. We want to change one of these. In this case, we're gonna change the max area to 800 so that we can allow for larger interfaces. So if I come back up here, I'll say, let's change the max area to 800. So your job is to figure out how to modify the substrate analyzer in order to allow for that. Then what we'll do, and actually I'll put two underscores, a couple underscores there so people know that's what they need to fill in. And then we'll get the number of matches from this. So I'm gonna press enter and say matches is equal to list sub analyzer dot calculate. And again, here we know the film is lithium iron phosphate. So film is equal to LIFEPO4. We know the substrate is equal to silicon. And we know the film millers in this case is equal to, and this is something I know from using the substrate analyzer, this has to be given a list of film millers. So I have to use the square brackets. And if I do the tuple, which is the parentheses, I can tell it I want just the one zero zero. I'm gonna press the right arrow until I'm highlighted outside of the square brackets, which means I can give it the next argument. And then I'm gonna type in substrate underscore Millers is equal to square brackets again, open up the parentheses, and then I'll say one comma one comma one for the one 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 direction of silicon. So this is how I get my matches. And your job is to figure out what we press here or what we type into Substrate Analyzer to modify it so we can get some matches for the system. I can tell you that if you run this with the default max area 400, you will not get any matches. And finally, at the end of this, let's, oops, let's close this doc string. And get this up to the middle. Let's print open parentheses matches. So I'll give everyone a minute to figure out what needs to go into the substrate analyzer. All right, in the substrate analyzer, as we noticed before, there is a max underscore area argument, and I can set that to 800. And if I shift run this, oh, I put print matches here. I'm actually going to say print, instead of print matches, I'm gonna print the length, L-E-N, open parentheses, matches. And this will tell me that there are two matches. So this is a way in which we can start to dial in the substrate analyzer to only give us certain conditions such as certain areas or certain interfaces such as the 111 silicon interface and the 100 lithium iron phosphate. Now the last section that we're gonna go over 
is actually building header interfaces themselves. And the reason we've gone through surfaces and then the substrate analyzer is because generating these hetero interfaces involves understanding how those are constructed, but more importantly, all the parameters that you tweak in hetero interface construction, or in this case, it'll be coherent interface construction, actually just go to slab generator and substrate analyzer. So as I mentioned before, there are three modules within the interfaces and analysis module. There's the third module called Coherent Interfaces, and it actually has a class called Coherent Interface Builder. So let's go ahead and import that. So I'm going to type from pymatgen dot analysis dot interfaces dot, and I'll press tab again. And again, we see that there are three modules here. Let's press enter on the Coherent Interfaces module. So that'll auto-complete that for me. And then we'll import. And now this is, again, if we had a traditional Jupyter lab, we could actually just press tab here and search through the module to get what we need. But for some reason right now, CoCalc is not participating with me and is not giving me that auto-complete. So I'm going to manually type in coherent with a capital C, interface with a capital I, Builder with a capital B. If I press Shift Enter, I'll have imported that mod, that class. And if I add a couple more cells so I can put this in the center, I can now work on using this coherent interface builder. Well, okay. Let's look at let's make a coherent interface builder. Let's do CIB. And in this case, I'm actually going to say equals coherent. And as soon as I type COH, I have enough unique letters that Python can autocomplete for me. So if I press tab here, oh, it's actually taking care of typing in the rest of coherent interface builder for me. So I don't always need to type in the entire name of a class in order to use it. One of the nice things is that we get autocomplete. And in this case, I'm going to open up and close my parentheses, hold down shift and press tab. And at the bottom, we'll see the doc string. And again, the doc string tells me I give it a substrate structure, a film structure, a film miller, a substrate miller. And optionally, if I want to tweak the parameters of how I look for those interface matches, I give it the ZSL generator. So we can give it the substrate analyzer that we're using before, since that inherits from ZSL generator, or we can give it a ZSL generator class itself. I'm going to close this. And instead of uh, in the workshop lesson online, you'll see that we actually generate or build a custom ZSL generator that has just the considerations for the max area 800. And we actually give that to the substrate analyzer. Uh, in this situation, we can just give it the default and we can actually look at uh, what we had before. So let's do uh, go into the coherent interface builder. And we know that we have to give it the lithium iron phosphate. So the first thing is the substrate structure. So let's give it actually silicon first, comma, and then we give it lithium iron phosphate. And actually, when I look at this bit of code, I'm already a little confused as to what is what. So I'm going to go back and press my cursor before silicon and start typing in substrate. If I press tab here, it'll actually give me an autocomplete for those keyword arguments. I'm going to press down and click on substrate structure. So I know the substrate is silicon. I'm going to put my cursor in front of the lithium iron phosphate. And again, I'm going to type film and press tab. And it'll give me an autocomplete where I can choose film structure. So now I've given it the substrate structure and the film structure. Now, if I go to the end, I can press shift tab again, and I'll go back to the doc string. If I scroll down, sorry, if I look at this, it says I need to give it a film miller and a substrate miller. In this exercise, I'm actually not going to uh, use any of the ZSL generators. I'm going to give it just one example. And the example I'm going to give it is actually going to be film underscore millers. And I'll press tab to autocomplete that. And I'm actually going to say that is going to be 
the uh, zero, uh, the zero zero one uh, direction of the lithium iron phosphate. So zero comma zero comma one. And then I'm going to press sub comma, and I'm going to type in substrate underscore Miller, and I'm going to make this the one one one. So one comma one comma one. And if I press shift enter, this coherent interface builder will run for a little bit. And now I have a coherent interface builder. So what can I do with this coherent interface builder? If I type in CIB, which is what I call this, press dot and press tab, I have a function called get interfaces. Well, that seems promising. Let's click on get interfaces, let it auto complete, open and close parentheses and hold shift and press tab. Now let's take a look at what this get interfaces function actually needs. It needs a termination, and it's not clear to me right now what exactly it means by that. It needs a gap, okay, and has a, some sort of floating point number. It needs a vacuum over the film, which again is a floating point number. And then it needs a film thickness and a substrate thickness, which could be in layers. Now, if I go down and scroll down, it'll tell me that if I, the, the doc string, that the terminations come from self.termination list. The gap is between the film and the substrate, and the vacuum over the film is the vacuum on top of the film. Those all seem pretty obvious. The in layers sets the thickness in layer units. So from this de description, I have some idea of how to use this get interfaces. So let's close the doc string. Next, what I need to do is actually figure out how to set the terminations. So I'm going to delete this and say CIB dot. And from the surface, from the doc string, I saw that it, there's an option to list the terminations. So let's press tab here. And if I scroll down, I can see there is an option, an argument or an attribute called terminations. I click on terminations and press shift enter. Uh -huh. So now this is starting to be a little promising. I can see that this coherent interface builder has actually found a number of different ways in which I can layer lithium iron phosphate on top of silicon. It's telling me a couple different things. On the substrate, all the surfaces are interfaced with silicon. Makes perfect sense. Remember from our surface, from our surface tutorial that in silicon, even though the interface is silicon, there's actually two different ways in which we can terminate that surface. And so we see, in fact, that there are couple repeats for the auction, for instance. It also tells us what the symmetry of that surface is. So in this case, it maintains an R3M. And over here, it's telling us that the interface for the lithium iron phosphate that faces the silicon substrate can either be terminated with lithium, oxygen, a PO combination, oxygen, or iron. And so these are the different choices that we have for choosing the terminations of our coherent interface. So I'm going to save one of these. I'm going to say term is term, T-E-R-M, is equal to C-I-B dot terminations. And since this is a list, I'm just going to give it the first one. So that's index zero in the square brackets. I'll press enter, not shift enter, just enter and type in term to make sure that I got the right one. If I type shift enter, I'll run that cell and it should print out this lithium silicon tuple, which is basically the termination that I want. So now let's actually get coherent interface builder to give us a bunch of interfaces. So I'm gonna type in, in the next cell, interfaces is equal to list, open and close my parentheses and say CIB, which is my coherent interface builder, dot get underscore, and I'll press tab to autocomplete interfaces for me. I'll open and close parentheses, and I'm just going to give it that single term that I already saved the termination for. And I'll press shift enter. It will run through for a little bit. In this case, it took 2.75 seconds. And I'll look at list interfaces. Oh, this is actually not what I wanted. 
because this is telling me there's a lot of data here because it's trying to print a lot of things to screen. Instead, I'm going to type len interfaces. And you can see that there are 30 possible interfaces for this single termination. So clearly, there's a lot of ways in which we can start to consider this. But even then, there's actually more manipulations that we can do. Because let's look at what an interface looks like. So I'm going to add a couple more cells here. And I'm going to type in interface is equal to interfaces zero. So I'm going to choose the first item in the interfaces list and store it in a variable called interface. This will let me print it out so I can look at what it actually looks like. So I'll shift run that and I'll actually go into the next cell and type in interface. If I shift enter on that, I can get a summary of what the interface looks like. And as you can see, it has a lot of atoms. In fact, it's a rather big cell. So notice that it is again has a structure summary. An interface, just like a slab, is actually a structure underneath. That means anything that I can do to a structure, I can do to a slab, and I can also do the same thing to an interface. Notice that it also has A, B, and C lattice vectors, a volume, in this case, almost 9,000 angstrom squared. If you have any experience with DFT, this is not a structure you would directly run DFT on because it would be very, very expensive. But this is one way in which we can generate interfaces to go ahead and start to look for unique systems that we can probably focus on and co compute properties such as interface energies. Now, another thing to note here is that the order of the, uh, of the atoms is not, is not the same as if we had the lithium iron phosphate on top and the silicon on bottom. And you might ask, well, does that mean that the order is actually wrong and the atoms are all mixed together? Again, if we had the Jupyter lab system, we could actually look at an interface and get an idea of what it is that it actually looks like in 3D. In this interface, unfortunately, we can't show that to you. So I'm going to go over to my Jupyter lab window again. I'm going to scroll down all the way to the bottom. To show you what one of these interfaces looks like. So if I rotate this, we can see that we have an interface. And in this interface, we have a substrate of silicon and a layer of lithium iron phosphate. Now, just due to time, I'm actually not going to type in too much of what's remaining because it's really important to see this visually as well. And switching back and forth might take up a lot of time um, that will not be useful to you. So just to demonstrate that this interface is actually useful in the context of perturbing or even um, um, distorting interfaces, there's a couple different important attributes that interfaces have. One is this gap right here between the two materials that you can play with. The other is this along these planes in the surface or along the directions of the surface, you can actually shift these atoms and those are technically different interfaces for the purposes of a first principles calculation. So finding the right combination of those is actually one of the important things that hopefully a materials project and other high throughput computational uh, researchers can identify better rules for. But for now, we really don't know how to determine what the correct termination is and what the correct orientation is. But we can perturb them within PyMetGen and play with them. So in this lat in this uh, in the notebook that is available on the website, there is a little demonstration in which we show you that there is a property called the gap, and in fact this gap can be modified. So it's initially set to 2.0, and we can set it to 5.0, and then come down and view the same interface. And you can very clearly see that we can play with that. There is another property called the in-plane offset, which looks exactly the same. And again, that is another property that you can just manipulate. And now you can manipulate this interface itself. I also mentioned that the interface is in fact a structure. So the final thing to do in this, uh, in this lesson would have been to actually take this interface as a structure 
and construct another slab. That is, if we cut this slab along, along this very long surface, sorry, this interface along this very long surface, we could theoretically again make a surface along there, which would look very different than if we just took this and put this in DFT. And we can do that because even though the slab generator takes a structure, a surface, or sorry, a slab is a structure, an interface is a structure. And I know people have asked, why do you use classes in PyMetrion? The difference between a function first approach and a class first approach is this exact reason. We can take something that looks like a structure and as long as it does the right things like a structure, we can treat it as a structure regardless of what it actually does underneath. So because we have a class based approach, anything that acts like a structure can be used in place of a structure, not only in slab generator, but as well in the number of different methods that we have to say write inputs into various calculations or various different types of codes, such as VASP and QChem and Quantum Espresso and CASTEP, all, all which run DFT or LAMPS which run Molecular Dynamics. And you'll actually see quite a bit of that tomorrow morning when we get to automating DFT, which will be taught by Ann Root, where she'll show you how to use input sets and in IO and come back at the end and show, show you how you can run high throughput density functional theory. That is actually have the system take care of running the calculation and give it back to you so that you can analyze it to do whatever science you're focusing on. So I know this has uh, been a little bit rushed at the end. So I'm gonna give a few minutes where people can ask questions and I'll actually answer questions within the Slack itself. I think that's the best way to go. Um, if you have any questions about how to use the slab generator or the hetero interface, the coherent interface builder, please go ahead and ask a question in the Slack. Helpers will try to help. And if not, I can always jump in and I can actually manipulate your notebook and show you how to do various things within that. So I hope this has been a useful uh, lesson. 